Hello. Welcome to Levels Plus Weekly, episode 14, where um, I've... It's just, it's been a weird week. <laughs> um, it just feels like there's a lot of anxiety in people, and I have certainly have felt that. Um, a lot of people that I know have had pretty, pretty turbulent weeks, I would say. And then, of course, I do need to address the uh, attack that happened on the 17th that a white supremacist specifically targeted Asian American businesses, specifically targeted women working within those businesses, and killed eight people, six of which were Asian women. Um, seven total were women. Um, just the hate needs to end, white supremacy needs to end, racism needs to end, and uh, if you want to help help it end, um, I'm going to provide a link here and below in the description. If you want to um, assist the families of those who uh, tragically lost their lives, due to uh, hate crime. So any assistance for those poor families would be appreciated. Um, I will be doing my donation after this video is recorded. And I want to take just a brief moment of silence. Uh, thank you for joining me in that moment. Um, and again, any sort of donation that you can contribute to the to those who lost someone important to them Wednesday would be appreciated. Um, as for this video proper, I've got two things I want to do. Um, you can kind of probably make some estimations based on this pile of items next to me. Um, I want to start my collection discussion. Um, I don't know if I've actually mentioned this in Levels Plus Weekly yet, but um, I've kind of wanted to spend episodes where I don't have pickups. I'm just kind of talking about some of the stuff that I have acquired over the years and provide some background and memories and such. And so part two of this video will be talking about the N64. So that's what that's all there for, along with uh, a few women characters to continue my um, celebration of Women's History Month. And I'm going to spend the first part of this episode talking about my favorite video game character of all time who is Jade from Beyond Good and Evil. There we go, there she is. And I do have a piece here, a paper craft that a very dear friend of mine gave me a few years ago that um, I really cherish. Um, so that's why that's here. Um, I do need to give a disclaimer <laughs> because I'm talking about an Ubisoft game. And if you follow Levels in the last year, um, you probably saw that I have written three different essays about Ubisoft in the wake of the Me Too movement and the sexual assaults, ha harassment, and abuse allegations slash occurrences that took place over the summer of 2020. And I have an article called F Ubisoft, <laughs> which is a very detailed breakdown of the majority of the things that took place last year. I haven't updated it recently because there hasn't been a whole lot of developments to my knowledge since um, the last time I updated, I want to say November. Um, so this video is not an endorsement of Ubisoft. It is not an endorsement of uh, the director of this game, Mikael Ansel, because he too was implicated at least in the abuse part of the allegations. Um, 
I've written two essays specifically about how my relationship with Beyond Good and Evil has shifted and adjusted following the all these allegations. Um, and there will be links to all those in the description. I highly recommend you check them out. Two of those articles were featured on the um, Critical Writing for Games site, Critical Distance, which is among the greatest honors that I have personally accomplished in the games writing sphere. Um, I have not submitted anything for this year because I haven't written a whole lot of in-depth stuff outside of the Femicom articles. Um, still just trying to figure out life <laughs> in this pandemic um, one year in. It's hard to believe it's been a year, really. Um, the, 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 the entire world view and perspective is completely changed. But I'm going to be referencing and probably doing a fair amount of reading from an article I've written about Jade, um, which I will also link below, and I will have the magic thing pop up here. Um, because while while the company that that created the game that she stars in has turned out to be really crappy, and I am incredibly disappointed in Incel and in other uh, figures in Ubisoft, uh, that doesn't take away from the fact of how powerful Jade is. And as one of the essays I wrote discusses, it, it, she stands as the antithesis of what Ubisoft became. Um, so in, in some sense, I actually feel a lot more pride in her now than I think I did before because of what she represents. So, Jade is easily, in my opinion, one of gaming's finest characters. She's extremely likable, she's got unique abilities, a ton of personality, and when you just first meet her, you get her. She's pretty mellow but strong-willed, which quickly comes to light in the earliest moments of the game when you first meet the Doms and have to fight them off to protect the uh, children that she has adopted in the wake of the attacks. Uh, she's also an aspiring journalist, one who wants to uncover the truth behind what exactly is going on on Hillies and what the Doms are doing with the people that they've stolen. Um, once the game gets going, uh, Jade's personality really begins, really begins to shine. Uh, you can see that she's upset over the current situation with the Dom. You can see that she's angry at the power company Optima for refusing to protect her lighthouse that was literally under siege when it goes out. Um, doubtful of the protection of the Alpha Sections, which are the military presence that are supposed to be protecting Hillies. And is very impassioned to save her orphan friends, no matter the cost. It just it becomes clear from the beginning of the game that she has some unknown connection with the Doms, one that will unravel itself as the game goes along. She's also frustrated at where she is in life. Her hovercraft is shot, her lighthouse unprotected, her journalism career is not going anywhere. It just feels like life has stalled for her, and it's it's a really good mirror to the realities of, of real life here on our planet, Earth. Um, and that's one of the things that I think that was really well done with Jade, is that she's so relatable. Um, you really just feel everything she's going through, and um, just it's, it's, it's really powerful, and it sticks to me to this day. Um, shortly after the, uh, the intro, um, she gets a break when she's commissioned to take photos of the many animals of Helix. Um, so, this is one of the mini games within Beyond Good and Evil, where you can earn pearls for collecting a bunch of photographs of the various animal life. 
which is a nice little uh, distraction from the core game, which is a bit dark in terms of story. So it's just kind of nice to uh, take a moment and, and soak in the environments through this side quest. And it's actually quite a bit of fun because some of them are, are, uh, are little rascals <laughs> and don't like to show themselves. Um, thanks to the pearl that um, Jade received from the doms that attacked the lighthouse, things are beginning to look up. Um, once the hovercraft is repaired and a chance to prove her journalism chops appears via an M-disc, which is the literal CD, um, Jade's confidence is understandably a bit shaky. She's unsure of the initial mission, unsure of the future ahead, but remains optimistic, almost blindly, for the, the work that she's about to do because she knows the value of it. Um, she enjoys doing photography, which is made clear from her conversations with her uncle Paige. She has an amazing depth to her that many video game protagonists just aspire to reach yet never, never ever do. And it is that depth that makes her so wonderful to uh, play as and to have her be your avatar for this world. Um, this is Finn. He wants to say hello and be a part of the video. Actually, he probably wants to be in the sun. So let's just accommodate him a little bit better here. Um, so as the game progresses a little bit more, Jade begins to discover a conspiracy. Um, and as we get deeper into the story, we put ourselves more and more into her shoes. Instead of skirting away from the terrors that loom in the shadows of the Alpha sections, she decides to become an official reporter for the Iris Network, which is a group of vigilantes that are determined to find out the truth about the Doms in the Alpha sections. Um, it's a risky move. I mean, everyone has had that point in their life where they have to make a choice that can totally change the direction of where they were going on their on their journey. And this is what Jade has to decide. Um, and I feel like the game does a good job of putting that thought there for a little bit, because you have the opportunity to explore Hillies before you go and make that decision. And it, it's a really nice little nod to, to that way that, that, that just the human brain works and the, the questioning cycle that we all do when we are faced with such a, a change, such an opportunity ourselves. Um, as I say here, it's a risky move yet many of us could face. What would we do in Jay's position? The game gives us the opportunity to take on the choice many of us might be hesitant to make, taking a stand against tyranny. And it's an enlightening one, one that has influenced me more than any other character's arc. So, the thing about Beyond Good and Evil is I feel it's a bit prescient in that it really gets into as much as Ubisoft of today denies the influence of politics in their games. Beyond Good and Evil was way into that, well, well, well ahead of any producer claim to the contrary. Uh, Beyond Good and Evil is a very political game. As a human being on Earth, rising to the challenge of tyranny is a risk. It's a, it's You're putting yourself in danger by doing so. And what Beyond Good and Evil gives people the opportunity to do is to do that without, um, without fear of reprisal. And that's powerful. And that's one of the things I really love about this game, is that it, it, it shows the power of protest. It shows the power of resistance. And Jade is a wonderful beacon of that messaging. Jade and her photography talent is something that this game pivots around. Um, she quickly relies heavily on her camera, not just for that cute side quest about animals, but to actually get the evidence that she needs to create investigative journalism that will be shared with the populace of Hillis. Um, 
she's a capable fighter with her Daijo stick, and eventually she gets a force disc launcher on her left hand that she's able to shoot little discs that you can stun stuff with and activate switches. But her that's not who she is. She is primarily a journalist, and she's trying to be as stealthy as possible. There's times when the game just doesn't work out, like most stealth games, and she's able to fight herself out of a lot of situations. But she's sneaking into government facilities, and she's taking pictures of illegal stuff. So that's the, that's the core of the game, is, is Jade is a journalist. She is a photographer. Um, as I say here, she's not Kratos, who brawls with everything in his way, including himself. Her purpose is to uncover the truth. And that's what's so refreshing, is that she's just... She's she prefers to avoid confrontation, but can't handle herself if she has to fight. And Jade just is able to be all of these different things. She can fight, she can hide, she can sneak... She can interact. She's just got much more to her than just I'm this or this. She's she's has depth, is what I'm trying to say. And part of what makes Jade so likable and so excellent is that Jodie Forrest, her voice actress, did a splendid job bringing her to life. Um, it's just nigh perfect. It's she's got power and compassion in her dialogue, and, and Jade goes through a lot in this game. And I really feel that um, Jody did a splendid job giving each emotion the proper amount of charge to be conveyed. And the writers did a really good job as well. Um, the story is excellent, and Jade's desire to be this reporter and to bring truth bring the truth out is so critical to why I love her as a character um, and Jade has really good animation as well the way she moves the way she bounces around as she walks she, which is just different from a lot of other characters she just has energy but it's clever and it's subtle it gives her, per, her, it expands her personality beyond just her voice and and her and her words. It's just through everything. Her fighting style is effective and smooth. It's acrobatic. It's graceful. It's a delight to fight characters as Jade because she's able to just whip around really quickly. But she's also really stealthy, and the way that she moves around and 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 makes herself minimally noticed is also as important as her acrobatic nature when she fights. This versatility just gives the player so many ways to engage in these various um, obstacles that they that she's presented with. And you can try to ambush the alpha sections, for example, or you can completely whip, whip around them. Um, and, and they don't even see you. And the camera is a huge part of her moveset because it defines Jade. Jade is defined being this journalist, and that is her passion, and it comes through everywhere. And that's what's so great about Jade, is that she's just constantly a delight to, to witness as you play through Beyond Good and Evil. And I, I, I just, I think she's brought so much to the table, especially for women protagonists. She's a woman of color. She's coded Asian. Um, especially when you consider that Ubisoft, the publisher, really, really, really went out of their way following the release of Beyond Good and Evil to not have women in leading roles for over 10 years. And it wasn't until, uh, like, Assassin's Creed Syndicate that a woman was playable in a notable Ubisoft game in, in a heightened role. And in that case, it wasn't even the main character. 
and it wasn't really until Odyssey with Cassandra that I feel that they got anywhere close to approaching how excellent of a job they did with Jade. Um, but this is what Jade has done. This is what she's done for gaming as a whole. She's offered us a chance to be a freedom fighter. She's brought a human touch to gaming. She's flown over the glut of sexually charged women clothed in barely their garments. She's helped open a new way of presenting games as more than bubbly kitty fare or gore-drenched bloodbaths. She's someone you can connect with. She's someone that you can feel all the things she's going through, her pain, her triumph, her shock, her vindication. And that's really special. And that's why she's my favorite character in all the video games and why Beyond Good and Evil, despite Ubisoft evolving the way that it did following its release into a, a cesspool of misogyny and sexism, that she stands as a beacon of hope. <sighs> and that's why I like Jade. Again, if you want to read more about Jade and Beyond Good and Evil and Ubisoft as they've evolved, uh, there will be links in the description for the three articles I wrote last year about Ubisoft and Beyond Good and Evil. We're going to have a cat intermission. I'm going to do a little meditation for a second and just kind of let go of some of the uh, <laughs> the still upset feelings I have towards Ubisoft and then we're going to do a collections video on the Nintendo 64 so see you in a minute Welcome to part two. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll lighten the mood a little bit in this back half. Um, we're going to talk about all the N64 games that I have in physical form. So I got the N64 um, December of 1996 for Christmas. And I got um, Super Mario 64 and Star Wars Shadows of the Empire. And... It was really important for me at that time. Um, I had only had an NES, which I got around 1986, and that was my only console. I didn't get a Genesis or a Super Nintendo or a Ninja Turbo Graphic 16. Um, and briefly, I only had like the opportunity to play 16-bit games during its heyday. Um, when I was able to either go to a friend's house or borrow one from a daycare parent. Um, apparently Flavia is really into Perfect Dark, which I guess makes sense. She is the knight, after all. Yeah. Um, and I had a Commodore 64 from about 1991, I want to say. And you're not supposed to knock it over. Are you trying to make this into a cat intermission video now? <laughs> huh? I guess I haven't had a really good cat interruption in the middle of one of these videos in a couple episodes, so here you go. Enjoy. Master of comic timing, that is Flavia. Okay. At least that way, if she knocks them over, it won't be so much of a fall. Where was I? Um, so the N64 was a really big deal for me. 
and I think it kind of cemented itself as one of my all-time favorite consoles just by the nature of its newness to me. Um, and Super Mario 64 blew me away, which I'll talk about when I get to that card. Um, and some of my most important gaming experiences took place on the N64. Um, and I will get to talk about a good chunk of those while I'm going through all of these. Um, but yeah, it, it's, uh, it's a very important console to me. I still have my original N64. It still works. I still have all of, I have three of the controllers that I had. Um, three? I think I'm down to two. Yeah, I think I'm down to two. Um, I had three, but one, uh, the analog stick got a little wonky. So I think I sold it. But, um, be really nice to get an N64 Mini or something, Nintendo. But anyway, let's go ahead and talk about these. Um, I will try to do it in an order that makes sense with release, but um, in, the, in terms of me acquiring it, let me just put it that way. Um, so that naturally means that I need to start with Super Mario 64. Um, in the chaos that was um, holiday cleanup, I lost the box for Mario 64. Um, so that is still the original cart that I got back in 1996. Um, I now have Super Mario 3D All-Stars, and I replayed Super Mario 64 on it um, last year. And it's still an incredibly awesome game, and it's still one of my favorite Mario games. Um, for a long time, it was my favorite Mario game. Um, but I think that Mario Odyssey finally brought a proper sequel to what it brought to the table. And um, I just have a lot of good memories of Mario 64. I remember... Um, just spending so much time wandering around in the worlds because um, they just seemed so big back in 1996-97 um, and trying to get all the stars and I do remember getting 120 stars um, and just like that feeling of accomplishment of doing that and now when I run through the game I played through it twice in like full and getting all 120 stars again which was last year on the Switch and then I want to say 2013 or 14. It was a little before I moved. Um, and I still love, like, the majority of the experience. I still think that it's a superb game. Um, I will say that TikTok Clock and Rainbow Ride are kind of obnoxious in, in retrospect, but I can't really knock any of this game. Um, it's definitely a period. It's a it's a period piece, of course. The camera could be better. Um, the controls could be just a little bit tighter. Um, the Switch does help with that a little bit. It felt pretty responsive when I was playing it on the Switch because um, the memory or the analog stick is better. The memory stick. That's a that's the wrong system. Um, <laughs> um, Speaking of memory, um, the controller packs, those are those are a fun little extra thing that not all N64 games had to deal with. I have a couple that do. Um, the, the fact that these cart some of these cartridges still didn't have a battery on them and they required passwords or out external memory. Just good times. <laughs> um, I had a third party uh, controller pack that uh, just crapped out and that was really devastating and that was one of the first times I, I learned the lesson try to avoid third-party stuff for when it comes to memory um, and I've kept that in mind with like everything I bought with Sony's memory cards like my all my PS1 and PS2 memory cards are uh, our official Sony ones. Um, I only have in sixty like Nintendo controller packs now. Um, it wasn't until very recently that third-party um, controllers actually ended up being okay too. 
But yeah, that's Mario 64. It's a lovely game. I, I treasure it greatly. Um, so the rest of the loose carts I've acquired from the same source after the box stuff, say Harvest Moon. Um, so we're going to go through the rest of these as best as I can remember their proper release date, because that's when I bought them. So next up will be Goldeneye, and I'm actually going to pull Goldeneye out of the box, because um, my Goldeneye is signed by Jaws himself, Richard Keel. And I will, um, through the magic of editing, show the link to the article where I discuss that on Levels Plus in more detail. But the short version that I will share with you now, and uh, I'll even pop a little picture of me getting my uh, head crushed by Jaws <laughs> after I talk about um, this. Um, I worked at a bookstore. Um, after I graduated community college and the bookstore decided to take part in a um, car show event that the nearby local cinema was doing with a couple of the local businesses and we had um, a few authors show up for um, for the event and Richard Keel was one of them he lived in the near the area um, and had lived in this small community um, when he was doing a lot of his smaller bit parts in the 60s and 70s. Um, my mom ran into his belly button when she was shopping once. Um, and I remember her just telling me the story that she turned the corner, uh, ran into someone, and then looked up, and then looked up, and then looked up, because she's about five foot two, five foot three, and he was over seven feet tall. Um, so Richard was an incredibly nice man. Um, really enjoyed getting a chance to talk to him. Um, he passed away a few years ago, unfortunately. Um, his height caused some complications with his spine, if I remember correctly. So he was in a wheelchair at this point um, when he was doing this book event with us. But he, he was just a, a delight to talk to. And um, I talk about it in the article, but it's such a good story that I can't really resist not talking about it in this video. <laughs> um, when I, I, I deliberately brought my copy of GoldenEye for him to sign. And I don't think that the story that he told me refers to GoldenEye because I don't think that um, Rare had the technology to do what he discussed. But Jaws appeared in a couple other games that Electronic Arts did, and I want to say even Activision did afterwards. Um, but he told me that there was a, a appearance that Jaws had made that looked like him, and they hadn't reached out to use his likeness, and were refusing to um, pay him royalties, if I remember correctly. And so he got his lawyer team on the, on the task, and they got a model of the Jaws character um, and looked at the polygons in his forehead. Um, Richard Keel has a bump in his forehead that is very pronounced, and the model also had that bump in the same place. And so he was able to uh, get some royalties because he was able to prove it in court. So just kind of an interesting story. I don't know which, which game it was. I don't think it was GoldenEye because I had not heard anything about Rare or Nintendo being sued by Richard Keel <laughs> for um, use of likeness without approval. Um, but GoldenEye itself is such a, a powerful game. Yes, it is. You weren't even alive for it. And even Flavia knows that it was such an important game for the N64 back then. Um, apparently, it's it's kitty corner time. So we'll have I'll have a lab cat. 
Um, I spent literal days playing GoldenEye with friends during high school, and we had challenged each other to do all of the cheat challenges to get through the stages as quickly as possible to earn the cheats. And I was the first one to get the invincibility code without a game shark, and I still feel a lot of accomplishment in that. <laughs> um, I think my time was 202, so it wasn't like the world's fastest time, but I remember just repeating the facility over and over and over and over because that one is one of the hardest because of the randomness of Dr. Doak showing up, because you have to do it on 007 agent level. Let me rephrase that. Double O agent level. Um, and a lot of pride there. I did have to use the Game Shark for two of them, which was the Silver PP7, and I want to say the All Guns cheat. Um, but I used the Game Shark to explore the little island in the dam that was, you know, the, the, the bee's knees. <laughs> When people started realizing, oh, there's this island over there that was was supposed to be in the game. Um, I remember going over there with the game shark. Um, it's really wild seeing the Xbox 360 um, version that was canceled out and about, and uh, such a shame that didn't happen. That actually could have convinced me to get a Xbox at some point. Um, GoldenEye is a marvelous game. It's definitely dated. It's definitely not smooth anymore. Um, but it's important. And it's one that I still think is fun. Um, you just have to kind of go into it understanding that it's a challenging game in ways that the, uh, the first person shooter has evolved away from in a lot of ways. But I love Rare's take on the first-person shooter, and nobody else, even Free Radical, quite nailed it as well as they did with GoldenEye Perfect Dark, in my opinion. Here's the picture of me being uh, destroyed by Richard Keel. <laughs> What's next? Uh, I think we're moving into 88 now, and this is probably next. Um, International Superstar Soccer 98. Um, there's nothing really particularly special about the card, so I'm just going to leave it in there. Um, this is my favorite sports game ever made, of all time, uh, no question. Um, I absolutely love International Superstar Soccer 98. I am trying to get International Superstar Soccer 2000, but because it was a relatively rare release, in contrast to uh, 6498, I've not been able to find it yet. Um, but I do want it. I would take a bare card, um, and I probably would still keep this. Um, I have spent way more time in this game than any other sports game. Um, I actually still, am I, as long as my controller pack battery holds out, <laughs> I'm in the middle of a world league that I jump back into from time to time, and whenever I get my HDMI converter to play um, all my old consoles on my HDMI TV, I will probably get back into world league and to try to get to the end. Um, I have a custom team of all of my So This Webcomic and Isolate characters. Um, I do wonder how accurate that is anymore, because I think I keep dropping characters. <laughs> Um, but this is the best playing sports game I've ever had. Um, I love the way it feels. I love just running around and doing passes and setting up stuff. I I remember when I was younger hooking up a, a tape player that I could put into um, RCA cables into and have it go into the VCR. And... So I used a VCR as my primary means of hooking up my N64 to a TV, because I think my TV, before I got my nice one, was an older model. So I did this with music, so I was able to actually have music playing in the background um, during the soccer game. So I had like R.E.M. and the Boo Fighters and Collective Soul, um, bands that I really enjoyed listening to on tape back in the 90s. Um, 
just doing doing their thing while I was playing soccer. Um, and it was just so much fun. And I just, I adore this game. I still do. Um, it's really, I haven't played Pro Evolution Soccer, which is kind of what replaced International Superstar Soccer um, in the PS2 era. Because um, I just, I don't know. There's just something really special about the N64 in this game for me that I just don't know if, if Konami's later efforts outside of that system could match. So I just never tried. But if you do come across any of the three International Superstar Soccer games and you like sports games, or even if you don't, honestly, because I'm pretty on the record for not liking most sports games, and this is like the latest sports game that I like in terms of like team sports, um, highly recommend that. All right, so my release dates are gonna probably be slightly off. But if my memory's correct, Body Harvest came out slightly before Ocarina of Time. Um, you know, it's funny. Um, I just talked about Body Harvest to, to some extent in the next um, video game music video. So this will be slightly redundant. But I'll try to... I'll, I'll keep it short, and then if you want to hear a little bit more about this game, you can listen to that. Um, so I bought Body Harvest um, when it came out um, because it just sounded like really interesting and it turned out that yes it actually is an incredibly interesting game. It's a flawed game for sure but it's a very interesting and in my opinion very influential game um, because it inspired Grand Theft Auto 3 um, DMA Design, who went on to become Rockstar North, developed Body Harvest. Um, the development history of this game is wild because it originally was a Nintendo property that they were working with DMA Design on. They were trying to make it an RPG because there were no RPGs on the system, and I don't know why they tapped DMA Design, who had no experience in the genre. <laughs> um, to my knowledge, um, they had done Lemmings and Uno Racers and, you know, stuff more like that speed. So it was just, it was kind of wild to have them go, DMA Design, please make us a role-playing game for our <laughs> Nintendo 64. Um, so there's a lot of backstory available on this now. Um, Nintendo Life did a really good retrospective, um, and I wrote... A pretty nice one myself, although it didn't have the details um, that Nintendo Life added to um, the Nintendo part of this discussion. Um, I wrote the Body Harvest article in Hardcore Gaming 101, which, bloop, um, which is apparently I'm just going to be talking about some of my uh, greatest writing accomplishments <laughs> in this video today. Um, but um, Body Harvest is the prototype for Grand Theft Auto 3. They took a lot of what this game does and they made it into a juggernaut of a franchise um, when they brought Grand Theft Auto to the PS2. And um, this is a very different game in terms of aesthetics. It's a sci-fi game. You're a marine guy shooting aliens. But it's really ahead of its time. It's got an open world kind of format where the maps are just ginormous. You are having to protect people um, from aliens that are trying to harvest them. And in that process, there's destructible environments, so you can destroy buildings, um, as can the aliens, which will cause more people to run out. Um, you can hop into the majority of the vehicles that are hanging out in the game and drive around or fly around or boat around. <laughs> um, it's a really cool game. It, it's clunky, for sure. It's definitely a, 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 a game where the mechanics have been improved upon by later games, but it's such a pioneer. And it's one that I'm very happy that I still have. It's a really cool game. So, highly recommend checking it out if you have not played it before. Alright, so next up is... 
Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. I have talked about this game a ton on the blog, um, but I do have the gold cart still. Uh, this was my original cart back in 1998. Um, it's still weird thinking that this is a collector's edition because I got it at launch. Um, this was a, like kind of the beginning of that type of thing happening. Um, so I guess we can blame Nintendo in some sense for the <laughs> deluxe collector's edition phenomena <laughs> that we have now. Um, you don't see too many great cards of Ocarina of Time floating around, though, I will say that. But they do exist. Um, Ocarina of Time is one of the most important games in the world to me. I change, it changed my understanding of how video games could be. I guess that one could even go as far to say it changed my life in some ways. Um, I've, I've talked about this on the blog specifically at this link. I, I, I am apparently becoming um, the opposite of Awata's um, thing that he used to do in directs and stuff, and I forget what it is, what he used to do, but it was something like that. I'm, I'm not deliberately trying to channel Awata. <laughs> I'm talking about these videos. Um, but Ocarina of Time, it just... It's, it's been eclipsed by later Zeldas in the 3D space. I feel like Breath of the Wild really is the greatest Zelda that's ever been made. And I feel like Twilight Princess is a really good evolution of how this game plays. But Ocarina is still a very special game. And it's a very important game and arguably one of the most important games of the 20th century. Um, and it's a very important game to me. And I do share this story on the blog, but it's such a good story that I'm just going to go ahead and say it here as well. Um, so bef right before this game came out, <clears throat> Um, I had it on pre-order at Toys R Us, and I lived in a small town that was 50 minutes away from where I was going to need to pick this up, and I was, let's see, in 98, I was 15, so I was not driving. So I was reliant on my parents to get me down there to pick it up. Um, and I was just, like, freaking out. I remember the hype just being greater probably than for any game the hype level being higher than for any game that I think I've ever felt before. And just the game came out, but I couldn't get it. And it was slowly killing me inside. So I went to a, um, a friend's house, my friend Chris, who had gotten it. And I recorded him and I playing the game because I started my own file just to just because I couldn't like not <laughs> I had to play it um, and we made a little bit of progress I think don't think we quite got to the Temple of Time to pull the, the Master Sword yet but we had gotten through at least I think the Dongo's Caverns by the time I came back home but I recorded this on a VHS tape and was obsessing over this tape for the rest of like the weekend and the day after like it was a holiday the day after and my mom happened to come into the living room where I was watching the tape and asked me what I was watching and I was like oh, this is what this is the game that I'm waiting to pick up and uh, out of the kindness of her heart she took me to the city to go get the game. Um, so I got the game about three days after my friend Chris did. So he had a heads up on me. Um, I got so into this game that I played through it in its entirety and beat Ganon and called him and just said, I beat Ganon. And he literally was beating Ganon at, when I called him. 
I was that into this game that I blazed through it and caught up on three days of a head start. And I spent a lot of time in Ocarina of Time um, just hanging out um, in the years to follow. Um, just creating my own little mini stories and, and I have a tendency to do that. I did that with Kirby's Adventure too. Like I just created like these little stories about the various variants. <laughs> Um, so like Red Link and Blue Link and Green Link, they were all distinct links with their own personalities and I don't know why I made that distinction, but I did. And um, it was just kind of cool to, to just keep living in that space. And Majora's Mask didn't offer that same opportunity because the game format just was different. It was designed to be a different type of game. Um, and I don't have Majora's Mask anymore. I did at the time. But uh, I will always keep this copy of Ocarina of Time because it's a very important game to me. All right. Well, we're already at a half an hour, so I guess this is going to be a long, a long video. Resident Evil 2. Wow. This was back when Capcom was still doing its Edge program. Um, Resident Evil 2. Uh, one of the three games that Capcom brought to the N64 in the entire lifeline of the system. Um, and easily the best one. Um, the other two, if you didn't know, were Mega Man 64, which was a port of Mega Man Legends. And then there was a magical Tetris challenge with Mickey Mouse, which was the only original game that Capcom published. Um, as is well known now, um, Nintendo really burned a lot of bridges with their licensing agreements on the NES and Super Nintendo, and when Sony showed up and basically said, we're not doing that, and here's discs so you have all the space in the world at the time, um, a lot of their stalwarts like Capcom and Square and Enix, Resident Evil 2 could be the best port of this game, of uh, the original game. Um, it's a technical masterwork. Um, Angel Studios, who are now Rockstar San Diego and do the Red Dead Redemption games, um, did a phenomenal job porting this two-disc um, behemoth into one N64 cart. This is one of the largest N64 carts ever made. I want to say it's 512 megabits or something like that. All the content is here. Um, there's additional features that have not really appeared to anything else, uh, to my knowledge. Um, you can change the blood color. There's codes for invincibility and infinite ammo that you put in. And there's also um, additional files that you can find that connect the game to um, Resident Evil 3. And I even want to say Code Veronica, but it definitely um, Resident Evil 3. Um, I think this is the best classic Resident Evil game. Um, I played 3, Nemesis, I played Code Veronica. Um, I've dabbled a little bit with the original PlayStation Resident Evil, but my most of my experience with that is actually with the GameCube port or remake. Um, but this is, this is, in my opinion, the best of the old school ones, um, even above the Resident Evil remake. Um, it's just a really good game. It's a, it's a delight to play. And uh, it's really, it, it just blows my mind. And I remember paying like $80 for this because Capcom charged a little extra because of those all those megabits. Um, and while the cutscenes don't look as good, um, generally it looks better. Um, the background textures are a little bit more fuzzy, but the polygon models are higher quality. Um, but again, like the fact that that's a PlayStation game, un real like honestly as uncompromised as it could get on the N sixty four, and as definitive is it really says something about um, Angel Studios. I'm pretty sure that Perfect Dark came out before the Ogre Battle, so. We'll go ahead and talk about Perfect Dark. So Perfect Dark is my favorite game that Rare ever made. 
again, I have put literal days into this, especially in the multiplayer, because the multiplayer mode is a, a, a phenomenal package all by itself. The biggest issue that Perfect Dark has, honestly, is that it <laughs> the N64 was not up to it. Um, they they tried to make a game probably that would have been better suited on the GameCube, in all honesty, um, work on the N64. And so it's it's doing its best. It's struggling in a, in a couple of the levels, but it is certainly trying. Um, I feel that in terms of the single player content that the first two thirds or so are excellent. And then I feel like the last third after the Vila um, assault mission, not the Vila, the, the, the Carrington Institute attack, uh, those last like two like couple missions are kind of a pain in the butt. Um, not a big fan of those. Um, because they're like so big, and I hate to say the word alien, but they're literally all, all the like the most of them are alien stages. <laughs> so I kind of have to. Um, they're just too big, um, but not enough diversity to keep things interesting, like that does in the first half, first two thirds or so of the game. Um, but Joanna Dark's a great character. I she's one of my favorite um, women in all of games. Uh, probably in like the top 15 or so. Um, that's who I play when I play multiplayer, as I play as Joanna. Um, usually in her Chicago outfit. And the multiplayer is still unmatched. I don't, like, I realize that the first person shooter has evolved a lot from 2000 when this game came out, but this is like, this is like my platonic ideal. There's very few first person shooters I've played since then that I actually get anywhere near as much enjoyment out of as I do with Perfect Dark and even Goldeneye for that matter. And um, you just, it, it's a superb game. And it's honestly, honestly, Perfect Dark is like the only reason I would even give the Xbox console a, a, a chance like the new the the new game that they just announced like that has me questioning my PlayStation 5 purchase for an Xbox series um, X purchase or whatever one the disc has because I care that much about Perfect Dark um, I'd also be able to play the the remaster of Perfect Dark where they upped all the all the visuals so it probably runs a whole lot better than this does but again, a, a, an overachiever, it really shot for the moon. Um, and while it didn't quite land center, it did land on the moon, and it's still a really good game. So my last boxed game from the time of the N64's lifespan, I have to use that qualifier, is Ogre Battle 64, Person of Lordly Caliber easily the best RPG on the N64. There is no question. Um, the only competition, honestly, is Paper Mario. <laughs> um, there's nothing wrong with Paper Mario. It's a really good game on its own right, but it is not Ogre Battle 64. Um, I love this game. It's on my top 50. It's a cherished game of mine. I really want to replay it. I'm like seriously considering buying the Wii U virtual console version so I can play it sooner than later. Um, it's an exquisite game and beautifully, it's one of the most beautiful in 64 games because the sprites look nice. Um, the environments are like when you get zoomed in are really nice. Of course, the, the maps that you're wandering about um, are not really fancy full at all. But like everywhere else, the game shines visually. It's, it's easily some of the best 2D stuff on the system. And it's got a phenomenal soundtrack, which I also talk about <laughs> in the uh, next week's top 111 VGM. 
so you'll get to hear me ramble about the soundtrack a lot there. And I think that no, I haven't played a game that quite mimics what Ogre Battle does. Um, the Super Nintendo one, uh, March of the Black Queen, is simpler than this. And there's something about the way that all of the mechanics of 64 work that just clicks so well in my head. And nobody else has really tried to m mimic Ogre Battle, to my knowledge. Um, more people have tried to mimic Tactics Ogre, which, of course, became the impetus for Square to make Final Fantasy Tactics. <laughs> um, so that took off, but I really feel like Ogre Battle 64 is an un unsung hero of the uh, strategy RPG space, and um, it's unfortunate that the cart itself is very expensive, and especially in complete form, um, but you can at least get it on the Wii U. Um, my hope, and this is a plea to you, Square Enix, because I do this every time I talk about <laughs> Ogre. Can you re-release the Ogre games, please? Remember that you have Enix games in your back catalog, too. Thanks. Alright, so we're going to talk about the, the last four loose carts I've got. Um, and then we'll get to the last box over there. So I got all of these together, but I'm going to go ahead and do them in order of um, release. So, um, And then I'll talk about the last one here by itself. So these three all came from a yard sale. Um, two of them I had owned before. I had sold Blast Core and Banjo-Kazooie and felt bad about it. So I wanted to reacquire them. So um, there was a daycare parent for my mom's that was having a yard sale and they were selling a bunch of N64 stuff. So I got Wave Race 64, Blast Core, and Banjo-Kazooie from them as well as Banjo-Tooie and I want to say one other game. But I didn't really care for Banjo-Tooie or the other game. I think it was, no. Um, so I sold them off, but um, I still have these three because they're really good. And Wave Race 64 is one of my favorite racing games of all time. And uh, I I feel like Nintendo software technologies just didn't know what to do with the GameCube sequel because it's just not as good. And I don't really know what. What happened there? Um, Wave Race 64 is just, it's a its a marvel that the ocean works the way that it does with the wave effects and everything. It's so dynamic, and Blue Storm just did not replicate that for, to me. Um, it's still actually, despite coming out in 96, I still think it's one of the more visually appealing in 64 games. Um, probably because I just like the ocean, and you're around the ocean an awful lot in that game. But I really think that the, the, the wave, like the, the water mechanics that they have in that game are superb. And um, I would love to see uh, Nintendo try again with the Switch. Maybe do a wave race and a 1080 together, but I'll talk about that when I get to 1080. Uh, Blast Core. Um, probably one of the more underrated rare attempts on the N64. Um, it was the second game that Rare released following uh, Killer Instinct Gold, but I think that um, that that first year after the launch of the N64 was kind of dry, so I feel like it came out of, I want to say, a month after Mario Kart 64 did in Turok, and those two kind of overshadowed it, and then a little later Goldeneye came out and like exploded. Um, so I feel like Blast Core just kind of got lost, um, despite being like Nintendo's pillar between the um, Mario Kart and Goldeneye. Um, it's a fun game. It's got um, a really unique premise of like having to demolish a whole bunch of buildings along the way to protect, um, to prevent a uh, runaway nuclear missile um, transport from ramming into it, and. Um, it's it does that 
concept really well, but it's also a really hard game. And there's a couple vehicles that are not that fun to play, like the the dump truck. <laughs> I hate the dump truck. Um, and there's an awful lot of missions that sure seem to want you to use that dump truck. Um, but despite that, it's it's a it's a really good game. It's definitely one of the better N64 games from the first year. So I, I recommend it if you haven't tried it. And then I got Banjo Kazooie. A uh, Banjo Kazooie is, in my opinion, the second best uh, 3D platformer on the system, and still one of the best ones ever made. Um, it was that perfect balance of platforming and collecting before a lot of people forgot how to balance that. Um, Nintendo and Rare included, and I'm looking at you, Banjo-Tooie and Donkey Kong 64 and Super Mario Sunshine, all took the wrong lessons from Banjo-Kazooie <laughs> and just added too much stuff to pick up. Um, but Banjo-Kazooie is great. Um, it's a marvelous game. It's still one of the best looking games in the system. It's got a really good soundtrack, which I again talk about. Apparently I'm just talking about games that I just talked about. So I'll not get into the music side of it here. But um, just really took the like the framework of Mario 64 and expanded upon it in like all the right ways. It's a really good evolution of that, and unfortunately that that's like the stopping point for a long time until more recently in terms of 3D platformers. Because um, even Nintendo had to like kind of reconfigure how to do 3D platformers, and that's kind of why Galaxy went in such a spiraling different direction. And it wasn't really until, like, recently that we got Odyssey, which is like Mario 64, but better. <laughs> so, um, and that is one that you can play on Rare Replay in a remastered form. And Banjo's and Smash, where he should have been all this time. And I'm secretly hoping that Joanna Dark is one of the last two DLC characters. I know she's not, but I would like, I would be so happy if she was. Because she was the other character that was robbed. And my last loose cart is 1080 Snowboarding. I think that 1080 Snowboarding might be the best looking game Nintendo put out on the N64. Um, it still looks pretty dang good. <laughs> I mean, for a game that came out in 1999, uh, it looks pretty dang good. Um, the snow looks great, and I think that's part of why is that it, it's a game that really takes advantage of the limited N64 um, view distance and all that, and just renders it all in snow. <laughs> just makes it makes things easier to render. Um, but the models are really nice, and um, it's one of my it's one of my other favorite racing games. It's really hard though. Um, those tricks are like I'm doing pretzels. Um, Hi. Hi. You like 1082? I don't think you've even seen me play it. Um, but despite the, the potentially too convoluted trick control scheme, um, it's still a lot of fun to play. It's still one of my favorite sports slash racing games. So, And again, that's another one where I feel like the, the NST developed sequel, Avalanche, just dropped the ball because they just didn't quite mimic it, but I did reacquire Avalanche, so I can try it again and see if my opinions change. I do love the art in Avalanche, though. Um, that is definitely among some of Nintendo's finest um, artwork, in my opinion. All right, and last but not least is my most recent acquisition, a complete Harvest Moon 64. Um, this came from my friend Izo, who is uh, an awesome, awesome person, awesome friend, who has been helping me with uh, First and Frequent Fantasy, um, and is working on the book cover as I'm talking to you. <laughs> And it looks amazing, and I can't wait to get that book out with this awesome-looking cover. Um, I'm so hyped. Um, 
I have not played Harvest Moon 64, so I can't really talk about the experience of playing it, um, because I don't have the means to do so. <laughs> I don't have an N64 cord that lets me play on my HDMI TV. So I can't really comment any more than I am never thought I'd have a complete Harvest Moon 64, and I realize how rare it is in this state. And I'm very tickled that he sold it to me at a pretty good price. Um, and uh, I'm excited to try it out sometime. Um, I'm not the hugest into farming sims, but this is supposedly the best Harvest Moon of all time. Um, so I'll give it a shot, see what I think. All right, well, that was a lot of minutes of me going over this, and if this one took this long, I can't wait to see what the Switch one's going to be like, because I've got like three times the games on the Switch <laughs> that I do here. Um, but this was fun. I think this this was a great exercise. I really enjoyed just kind of talking about these games and my, my history with them, and um, just kind of thoughts and it was, a, it was a nice nice opposite of the prior half of this video where it was kind of a little intense and it was just kind of nice to, to talk about these and come at it from a, 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 a different approach. So I think that this will be a really good video, a really long one, but a really good video. So I want to say thank you for um, tuning in. Uh, next week, I'm go I, I think I know what I want to do. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to spend some time spotlighting some of the women creators that I follow on YouTube and Twitch. Um, and I'm going to have a massive, and I'm not kidding, massive Famicom order that I am really hoping shows up this week. Um, it's in the United States. I've ordered it from Japan. It's already in the United States. Uh, I've got 29 different games for Famicom. Um, and I'm just like, my I, I still haven't quite realized how awesome this is. And it's going to be a delight to open that box and look at all this stuff. Because I got some really cool games. Um, um, some that I've always wanted to have. Um, and you'll even get some sneak peeks into what book two and book, I don't know the number yet because they're so far in the future. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I got a lot of good headway on, on getting the research materials for Femicom. So that will be fun. And I also have some Amiibo. I've got um, the three Amiibo that are coming out this week that I'll be picking up as well. So we'll have a lot of pickups next week. So probably a bit of a shorter video in some ways because I'm not going to probably spend too much time talking about the individual games as much and certainly not the Amiibo. It'll just be showing them off. But um, I think I could spend a decent amount of time talking about awesome women doing awesome stuff on YouTube and Twitch. So look forward to that and uh, I will see you next time. Take care.